Good evening, everyone. It's me, Fasman. I'm joined today with Kidra, and we are going to be talking about retro gaming. Hello there. So basically, we are going to be presenting this panel in sort of a podcast format due to the fact that retro gaming is basically this one big giant rabbit hole that everyone has a slightly different interpretation of or use of. So I think the best way to sort of present the information is sort of in a podcast and a conversation style so that you can pick out the little bits of information that uh, you want to gain out of it and hopefully feel inspired so that you can actually try yourself to get into the community and join the hobby because it's really a fantastic hobby. It is. And we have 45 minutes. That's barely scratching the surface, but enough to get people into the hobby, I think. Yes, I think we can basically call this a little taster. Get get your palates nice Mm. and wet about the subject and uh, see if this is for you because it might not be, but I I really think that it goes well with furries. Definitely. So to start off with, what I think the best sort of way to understand what retro gaming is is just to share our stories. So I'm going to be sharing my story on it and Kidra's going to be sharing his. And retro gaming, it's about memories and nostalgia, basically. It's about things that you experience as a child. And as you grow up, you want to re-experience those things. And you want to explore it a bit more, try opportunities and things that you couldn't as, as a kid. So I think the best way is for you to start, Kidra. Can you share us your story? Well, gladly. Uh, you see, I played with very old consoles when I, wait, uh, when I was a little child, like... The original Pong consoles from back then it only could do Pong games. And I remember that I also played a bit on an Atari 2600 or Atari VCS as it was originally called. But my first own console, that was a Sega Master System. And I have fond memories of that system. Basically back then it was the competing product to the, in the US, very much beloved Nintendo Entertainment System. Here in Europe it was a bit different, the Master System and Sega had a better footing in the market, so I had a Master System and it was also a bonding experience with parents and grandparents who helped me with the video games that I could not yet understand fully because English, for example. So it's a bit sad that back then when the Master System broke it went into the trash with all the video games because it was just old, we had newer stuff and we held no value to these things, something that I regretted. So what got me into retro gaming was when I just for the fun of it tried an emulator. After the Master System I had a Game Boy and an Amiga 500 by Commodore and it was an Amiga emulator that I tried. And to my surprise, it was like an anchor back into the childhood because of the games that I knew from back then, I played them again. And together with the games, the old emotions, what it was like to be, you know, a child, the friendships back then, the entire context came back and I could really get sunk into it for hours and it felt great. So I've always then dabbled a little bit in retro gaming here and there, but it really took off when I got interested into um, FPGAs. And at first, I did not collect original hardware. So then when I saw that there's FPGA now, FPGAs now that can recreate the old systems, I wanted to do it the proper way. Like, get my old games back. I still had a good amount of Game Boy games from back then. I had no more of my Master System games, so I wanted them back. And nowadays, I dump my own games. I collect them. I dump the ROM and this is what I play. And uh, also for those of you listening, if you don't know what FPGA is, we are going to delve into all of that a little bit later. Um, Mm -hmm. It's basically a modern recreation of a system using hardware on a hardware level. Yeah, because it's quite, how to say, challenging to get the old systems running again on modern hardware like video connectors for monitors back then they were way different no hdmi for example and the modern recreations try to mitigate these issue, issues usually so but yeah i got back into the hobby because of the memories attached to it and the sudden value that i held to it and well you actually inspired me to buy original hardware again i saw 
the same version of a master system with the same BIOS that I had back then on eBay. I bought it and I refurbished that thing. Yeah, the bad influence that I am. <laughs> yes. Yeah, my, my story isn't too much dissimilar. Basically, growing up, um, we always had a computer in us. It used to be my father's things, thing. He was fascinated by computers. He eventually had his own little company, but we always had the likely computer in, in the house. Now, I'm talking about uh, the early 90s, so it, it was like 286 or 386 running DOS, and there was OutRun and all of that. And I, I used to go to like my nieces and nephews' houses, and they had this strange thing that you connected to a TV, and you put a cartridge on top, and they call it a TV game in South Africa. It's basically, we now know this today as a family clone. And I used to play hours and hours when I went to go and visit them on the system because unlike the computer we had at home, um, it was just so much easier than trying to navigate menus or DOS to try and start the game that you wanted to start. All of the cartridges, I liked the idea that like you had a little physical thing that you can put in and you could swap around. So I started nagging my parents to get one. And eventually, with much protest from my father because he had this strange view that it's inferior, it's terrible, it's nowhere near as good a computer, we've already got a computer, so why must we go out and get another game system you have got your computer? So nonetheless, after much protest, I finally got one on Christmas, I got a single cartridge with 32 in one, because family clone and unfortunately Nintendo never came to South Africa officially because of apartheid back then, so we, we got a, a bootleg one. And I played that day in, day out. It had like Mario Brothers on there, and Super Mario Brothers 2, and Tetris, and uh, Pinball. And what was surprising, like you mentioned, uh, your parents also enjoying it, is mine basically started taking over the system. They played it more than me. But they played uh, Pinball late to the morning hours, uh, trying to beat each other's scores in there. <laughs> Which is uh, <laughs> ironic, because my father yeah. hated the idea of a TV game. Well, you see, I promised my mom when lockdown is over that I take one of my modern console systems with me so that she can play the old Master System game Transport again. She liked to play that back then. But otherwise, you see, my grandfather helped me with playing the game Zillion, which required inputting codes that you find in a room. It's sort of a little bit similar to elevator action. Yeah, so basically uh, we had the system and eventually I finally got them to do it and they sort of took, took over with it, even though it was an inferior thing. And sadly, the uh, house got broken into and that got stolen. And this was now the early 90s and luckily we had insurance. We were extremely lucky back then and they finally replaced it. So we got, I still had my 32 in one cartridge somewhere. But uh, my father, of course, being the person he is, he knows better, he insisted that I get something newer and he got me a Sega Mega Drive 2. With that I only had one or two games, so I had Sonic 2 and Echo the Dolphin. In fact I think Echo was my, my sister's game. But nonetheless I, I like played Sonic 2 and I eventually I managed to finish it but they never really bought more games for it. We rented once or twice but that was about it. So this, the system, I never fully utilized it. Growing up, of course, yeah, I started to forget about it. And eventually, one day, I discovered software emulation. Uh, this was back in DOS, and I'm not going to go into detail now. I got the emulator with the ROMs. But I managed to play all of the other Sonic games on PC, and I noticed that it just wasn't the same as playing it on my Mega Drive. So I started looking at charity shops and second-hand shops and that sort of stuff. And eventually uh, I started getting into collecting and this was before it was like widespread on the internet. Uh, it was literally going to every single second hand shop that ever, if I go on a weekend visiting someone, I walk past one, I always go in to see what's there. And I picked up a nice small collection for the Mega Drive. And I just fell in love with doing this and I was so glad to discover that there's actually a hobby based about this that I part of now and uh, I basically more collect like hardware than, than games at the moment because I just find it fascinating to fix those and repair those and see what the systems can actually do from back in the day and prove my father wrong each and every time by saying these things are actually extremely cool compared to the computer. 
Yeah, for sure. The hardware back then with the limited resources that it had and what the artists creating the video games achieved is mind-boggling. Yeah, and, and that's something that I really enjoy is seeing, uh, getting like a new system like the Commodore 64 one, going to the demos, seeing, running a few demos on it and seeing just how far people could actually push the limits of hardware. Like a little 7 megahertz CPU on the C64 that can push it well above and beyond what its original capabilities was. And it mm. just brings me a lot of joy seeing that. Yeah, and these old systems, you can still fully understand them if you want to get into programming and the theory of computing. These are actually quite good to start with because the CPUs are not that complex. No, but I mean... You mentioning that your parents um, also got into gaming. Have I ever told you how I got my Game Boy? No, you haven't. How did you get your Game Boy? It's what, something what my mom told me not too long ago, because I didn't remember it. She told me that I was basically begging them all the time for a Game Boy, because all the other um, kids in primary school had one. And when it turned out to be a social thing that the children would be playing with their link cables and play against each other, my parents didn't want me to feel left out, so that is how I got my Game Boy, because of the social factor. So you used to go around and then use the cable and stuff to actually play multiplayer games in the game more. That was the idea, but it never happened for you. Yeah, I, I never, I nearly got the link cable, but there were so few of those in South Africa. I basically got mine because I had a friend or my father's, particularly my father's friend's son. He used to come over and visit and he used to brag about his Game Boy and he really didn't treat his ball where the screen was all busted and was scratched up and all of that. And he mm. had a few games. And I, I love the fact that you can have something portable to play with. And uh, we basically were invited to Switzerland. We have a good friend in Switzerland uh, that paid for a trip for us to go and visit. And when we went there, of course, I had a little bit of an allowance. We stayed there for three weeks, so every week we got a bit of money. And while we were in Switzerland, I noticed that Game Boys there was extremely cheap compared to what we paid in South Africa. So I actually bought mm. my first Game Boy in Switzerland. And, uh, oh, that's awesome. I made the huge mistake of choosing my two starter games. But my, one, my one was the cheapest one you could get. Didn't have the packing Tetris. It, it sucks. I wish I had Tetris. So the two games I chose for the Game Boy was Paperboy and Speedball. Oh, and uh, both decisions. both of those games use motion. It's very fast paced because Paperboy you can't stop. It's constantly like moving upwards on the screen, and the Game Boy screen blurs when there's any motion on it. Same with uh, Speedball. Speedball used to be the sort of futuristic uh, soccer game, I can call it, and you had all these players running around and you can't see anything. It was terrible. Mm. Although I did get some games later on, but also that, that got stolen, that Game Boy. Uh, so that, that's another thing I replaced as I grew up. I found a replacement somewhere and I refurbished it, put a new case onto it. So I still love that system. Yeah, I'm lucky that I still have my original Game Boy from back then. I just fixed the screen myself, replaced the screen shield and it's still working and got a Game Boy Color of eBay and did a screen mod on that one, which I actually used to play, like proper IPS panel in a Game Boy. Yeah, those things are like virtually indestructible Game Boys. Um, it's a good like start of system to get if you want to start collecting real hardware. They're fairly cheap. Uh, locally in South Africa, they're like 700 bucks. And 90% of the time, you don't have to do much for it. Um, the screen, of course, fades over time, but you can get modern IPS replacements for it, which I would recommend just getting anyway so that you don't have to suffer like I did playing Paperboy. And I, I would suggest anyone that wants to start with real hardware stop that. But now that we're on the topic of real hardware, um, you mentioned before that you had a Sega Master System. That is correct. Do you want to go into how you got it, why you chose it, that sort of sure. thing? Um, when I was getting my old games back together, that was my original goal. I just wanted my old games and not more. But of course, it never stops there. I, by chance, saw an offer on the same BIOS version master system that I had back then. 
same BIOS version because the BIOS 1.3 had a hidden game included, the snail maze that was never released on cartridge. And that is what I wanted back. Had a fair price, had even the included Sega card of Hang On and the original manual, so I had to get it. It was a no-brainer really. But then I noticed, you know the difference between um, the different TV regions? Well, PAL games play way too slow, NTSC games play at the proper speed, or rather, the console at NTSC speed plays at the correct speed, so I could not stomach the slow dot games anymore, so I modified the master system with a switch that I could switch between PAL and PAL 60, which is luckily easy enough to do on a master system. I polished it up, cleaned it, and yeah, it's like a relic from my childhood now. It's awesome, and it's interesting that you mentioned that you had to modify to get it back to full speed. It's basically the same as Story Hard with my Famicom. Um, so, in South Africa, once again, you don't really have, you never had Nintendo products. So, you had TV games, which was all family clones of various sorts and various qualities. So as I grew up into the hobby and things that I did, and wanted to replace my Famicom that, that got stolen by my family clan. Mm. So eventually I tracked down someone that went on holiday to Japan and I was like, okay, I need you to check all of the shops for me with secondhand stuff, but they're going to sell it as junk. I need you to bring me back a Famiclone, oh, a, a proper Famicom, so a Nintendo Famicom, which uh, if you're from America, Famicom is basically the precursor to the NES. And it was quite cheap, it was less than a hundred grand, but of course the shipping for it was about 500 or 600 grand and got shipped to South Africa. I got it here, plugged it in, and I couldn't get video output on this thing, no matter what I did. Because, like you mentioned, the different video standards, uh, the Japanese RF standard, because it only has RF out, isn't compatible with PAL or NTSC RF. So I had to like mm -hmm. mod in the AV mod for it, and what an audio mod for it. I finally got this thing working and it's just been like treasure in my collection ever since. It, it's like I got back what I had before. Even better, I've got the original one, so the sound is better, the picture quality is better. Awesome. And I think once you start with retro gaming, you not only collect the games or collect the consoles, but you also look into the history of the systems, what the time was back then, so retro book collecting, like books about retro gaming and retro systems, is also a big part of it. Like expanding your mind, what was the world really like back then when you were just a child, not seeing all of it. So in context, what the companies were like, the history, how games came to be, it is really fascinating to read. Yeah, and uh, in terms of books, you know, you put bitmap books and all of that, and it, it's fascinating. I don't really collect the books, but for me it's more about the history. I started collecting systems that I never grew up with. Uh, for instance, the Commodore Amiga, I, I absolutely love that computer system. It's a fantastic system. I, nef I never grew up with it at all. Um, they're quite rare in South Africa, quite expensive to get them uh, all of, especially if you want like an accelerated version or you want the best example out there. And all of the, them will have the same problems with capacitors failing, it needs repairs, or the, the audio output isn't working properly because there's a trace that's burned out due to capacitor leakage, or it all needs a little bit of TLC. So you go down this rabbit hole of reading and researching how to repair the systems to get it up to and running again. And mm. this is so much fun to do, you know? It's, it's not always about the nostalgia fact. Nostalgia fact. It's also about experiencing new things and new experiences. You know. Yeah. Retro gaming is also celebrating technology and the history of technology and learning in the process. Yeah, and it's also about preserving that. I mean, one of the most fun things I love doing with some of my systems is whenever I get someone that, that visits and we, we speak about old computers or retro gaming, and the first thing they always say is. Oh, yeah, I had a, a ZX Spectrum because that was very popular here. Yeah. And I, I'm, I always go like, have you ever seen the Commodore 64 and actually hook it up for them and they can experience this thing that they've never seen before. And then when I show them the ZX Spectrum afterwards, they go, oh, but the Commodore was actually slightly better in a lot of ways. 
Why did we get this here? Funny enough, I never had a Commodore 64, but reading a book about the Swedish Commodore 64 community, where, you know, group and scene members back then are now CEOs of leading video game companies, I kind of got interested in that system and explored more than the Amiga software that I had. It's like expanding your field of view to other systems, like you said. Oh, definitely, and so many people started off their careers by working on these old primitive systems. I was reading up the other day about Elon Musk. Elon Musk actually got his start in computer coding because there was a computer programming internship in South Africa. Back in the day, he was only 12, he couldn't participate, but his father sort of, back then you could do these things, went in and spoke to the teacher and asked him if they can just at least see what Elon can do. And Elon started mm. joining this and it was on the C64 as a platform. And uh, he just fell in love with the system he, and started programming with it. And they recognized that he's very, very good at programming at his age. And eventually got him like slots in the university to study computer programming. Even though he was 12, mm. he used to do it after school. He used to go in and partake in the sort of intern studyship program. And that, that's how he got his foot in the door at a very early age. That's amazing. And how many of our modern game uh, companies, Electronic Arts, for instance, started off uh, as well on the C64 and Specky, the ports, and a whole bunch of other systems as well. You know, most of what we've got today started back then, and it's just so much fun to experience it. Yeah, look at Team 17 from back then and still around. Actually, some of my favorite games back then, like Alien Breed. They were made by them, or Worms. That was at the end of the 80s. Um, they're still around, they're still producing. And that sort of brings us into, like, preserving these things. And I'm just going to go over, because my thing is, I just collect the library. And I just want to say that this isn't a hobby for everyone. It's fun and it's exciting to talk about it. But it does take a lot of space. It takes a lot of dedication. You constantly have to take the machines out and service them. And by servicing, what does that mean? You have to take it out, plug it in, play it for a bit. And more often than not, you'll notice one or two things aren't working. Open it up and repair it. And then, you know, after a few years, it's stuff goes wrong again. You have to redo the same thing. It's not permanent. Um, there is like modern efforts to try and recreate this, which I think could draw you way more versed in, and that's FPGAs and modern mm. consoles. I don't know if you want to go into that a little bit. Sure. I mean, there are two major ways of trying to recreate the experience from back then on modern systems. The first is software emulation. And software emulation is a translation process where the instructions for, let's say, an NES, Super NES, Master System or Commodore 64 are translated at runtime into something that an Intel CPU can understand and execute. So there's a software layer in between trying to recreate the system. But the translation process takes time, is never as accurate as original hardware, so, in retro gaming, not on original hardware, you have a few factors to keep in mind. One is input lag. How long does it take till your button press is actually executed on the screen? That is a major problem point. Um, for software emulation, because it's a translation process, you need a fast system. That is why a Raspberry Pi doesn't do it. I try to use them, I use them for a longer time, but once you get to know about input lag, you can't unsee that. You feel it and games feel spongy. Um, it doesn't feel like back then and many people chalk it off as, well, I'm getting older, I'm not as good anymore. But in reality, it's input lag from the emulation and your screen. Yeah, that's something that I've seen happen quite often with people, especially if they haven't, if I've seen it happen with some. You know, Sonic 2, and they'll go, Hi, I used to play this game as a kid, I loved it. And then um, they go out and then they get uh, Sega Mega Drive Mini. 
and they'll plug it into HDMI, they'll plug the controllers into it, it's software emulation, and they play the first stage, and they just can't get the jumps right. They keep on dying. Mm. And eventually, it's like, oh, it's I'm actually out of practice. I'm, I'm, I haven't played this in a while. My reaction time is getting slower. And when you actually try it at my house, like on the real hardware, suddenly it's like, yeah, this, this is great. This is exactly like I remember it. Mm -hmm. And the Mega Drive Mini isn't even that bad at software emulation, as long as you put your screen, the TV, into game mode where it doesn't do post-processing and gets faster. It is actually not the worst software emulation out there. It's on the verge, but it's enjoyable. Raspberry Pis, you even have input lag on Game Boys. I could compare it to my original Game Boy, very noticeable, once you saw it. So, a different approach is using field programmable gate arrays, or FPGAs, which are prototyping chips. Roughly said, you can load a, a so-called core or schematics into an FPGA and it recreates the logic in real hardware, like it recreates um, basically the hardware. So imagine such a chip turning into an NES, assuming that the core is usually open source done by a community who research on how to do that, they decap the chips, go over the traces inside the chips with microscopes and map them trying to recreate the logic. That has the potential to be a one-to-one -one hardware recreation. So there are open source projects out there that use this and commercial consoles. I have a Mega SG from Analog, which is a commercial FPGA clone console that can play real cartridges. I really like that system. It has HDMI out, you can plug in original Mega Drive gamepads. Luckily there are modern recreations of these original gamepads available, otherwise it would be a bit troublesome to get the right ones. But with that, you have in the system itself no input lag. It's original, if done correct. Myst was a system that had VGA out and DB9 in, so the Atari joystick port with the nine pins that the Commodore 64, the Mega Drive and the Master System, for example, had. So that was an open source project where volunteers and programmers recreated these old systems. It was a box where you could say, okay, I want a ZX Spectrum, I want a Commodore 64, or I want a master system, and the chip will program itself and output the video. That later got ported to a different platform. There is a small development board with a bigger FPGA because an FPGA is limited by how many logic elements and size it has, how big the chips are that you can fit in there. That's the limiting factor, really. The bigger the FPGA is, the more expensive they are. So the Mist got ported to the DE10 Nano by Terrasic, which has USB and HDMI out. And it's heavily subsidized because it is a learning board, also mental university. So I heard rumors that the chip on this board actually costs $200, it's an industry-grade chip, but they're selling the entire board for $120. Sounds like a perfect deal. So somebody in the community ported that over. And that is now the Mister, which attracted a lot of people with active development. And you have a lot of cores, a card cores, a lot of different systems, a lot of different computer systems. They vary in quality, of course. Not all of them are equally mature. But depending on what you want to do, the Mega SG or other analog consoles are retail products. They're easier to use. You have a GUI on screen. You set up your scan lines, what aspect ratio you want, you can play. The Mister is a do-it-yourself at home project. So you need to source a few extra add-on boards like a RAM board that is plugged into GPIO pins, you should have also an I.O. board that also incorporates an active fan to cool the FPGA. It's sad to not be necessary. I still like to keep my devices cool for longer long livity. And if you are willing to make this more of a involved hobby in terms of learning what the correct settings are, where to configure it, 
the mister is a good choice, but it's a bit of work to get into because it's a fast moving project. And a lot of the footage that you see in the background is actually recorded from a mister that I use. Yeah, that's Same just, with the Mega SG. That's just something I want to quickly just touch base on. Um, mm -hmm. So you need to remember that we spoke a little bit about video standards and video outputs before. So for those of you that want to get into the hobby, especially in the gaming side, because you do live streams and that sort of stuff, the Mr. or one of the Mega SGs or anything from Analog is actually like the perfect jumping off point for you. Because on real hardware, it's very difficult to get a modern output for it. Uh, most of the systems used RF, if you're lucky they had composite. And capturing analog video in a modern setting is very difficult and it's very grainy and it's very fuzzy. Now, luckily, people are trying to keep these old systems alive and you can get HDMI mods for a lot of them. Or HDMI compatible cables even for some of them. But all of this is quite expensive and in terms of like pricing and that sort of thing, like for instance, you heard me speaking about the Famicom before or the NES. To do an HDMI mod on the NES or Famicom will actually cost you more than just buying a mister. And it'll only lock you into just being being able to do one system. While if you get like a mister, you can do a whole bunch of cores and you can do a whole bunch of games. Um, the only thing to remember is that it's a digital platform, the Mister, so you need to get a way to get your games onto the system. And I think you've got a system for doing that? Uh, yes, I use a Retro 2, which um, you plug cartridges into. There's also adapter cartridges, for example, Game Boy, Nintendo 64. Uh, don't get too... Um, Excited here, Nintendo 64 is not properly emulated on anything, even software emulation is not really that great, so... But Super Nintendo, Mega Drive, etc. And the Retro plugs into the computer via USB and appears like a USB mass storage device. You see a tiny ROM file, you drag it to your desktop and that's it. You have your own legally bought game backed up and can use that ROM to play it. You know, and most countries are, actually allow that legally. It's just something that I would recommend everyone to check out in their own countries. But legally, if you have a physical... In South Africa, we've got actually a retention law. It says that if you've got a medium that is prone to decaying over time, EPOMs, you're allowed to make one working backup to a different format. And I, I think uh, we can actually legally do that here. I think in the UK and US there's similar things, but I would recommend you guys, if you're in your own countries, read up on the legislation first. Yeah, and I think this is also a good point to say we are not lawyers, we're not giving you any legal advice here. You should always check what is legal in your own country. We are doing everything legal to the best of our understanding in our own countries. And if you are in one of those countries where it's like illegal to make any duplication whatsoever, the analog products are probably the best solution for you. Yes, because they play the cartridges directly. They can even use the special chips on some of the cartridges. And if I'm not mistaken, you own the Mega SG, but they also make a NES version that's almost impossible to get. And a Super all of them, Nintendo hmm. version now as well? Yeah, all of them are currently sold out. That is the big disadvantage with analog. It's small runs. And currently they are preparing to get a clone system from the TurboGrafx-16, um, also known as PC Engine Duo, going. So I guess they're preparing that. But yeah, um, NES, SNES, Mega Drive slash Genesis for you folks in the US. And now TurboGrafx-60 six, and PC Engine Duo. They are releasing a Game Boy clone, but that was sold out within five minutes. Scalpers bought most of it. So, the usual business. Yeah, and Scalpers is a big problem. It's not just graphics cards that they grab. It's literally everything these days. <laughs> but you know, before I forget it, I only spoke of disadvantages in software emulation so far. Both methods, software emulation or FPGA, let's call it simulation, they both have their pros and cons. I mean, when we played games back then, we did so on a CRT. And nowadays they are not being produced new anymore, so the games back then actually used some 
attributes of how CRT is displayed, images to get more effects and colors on the screen that the console could actually do. So if you are getting a perfect, pixel perfect RGB image on screen where you see all the checkerboard patterns or lines that you, for example, see in the palm trees in Sonic 2, that's okay. That is up to taste, but on composite screens like CRTs with composite in, these actually blended into each other and created a transparency effect. So there's a matter of taste here now. And on an FPGA, you do not have as elaborate shaders like you have on a powerful PC with graphics cards where you can actually select, I think it was the CRT Royale shader that is available on some platforms that recreates the screen geometry to an extent, the Apache grill, and even the phosphor glow and everything that a CRT had. So, I mean, you have limited filters on FPGAs, but if image authenticity is your thing, software emulator can do that better. No, and of course, it's nowhere near as good as real hardware because there's... On a CRT, when they manufacture this blown glass, it's not perfect. The curvature always mm -hmm. has a little bit of a bad curve to it, and they actually use magnets stuck to the back of them to fix that. And the curve is, is different based on what manufacturer you get. The grid pattern is different. Um, like, for instance, if you've got uh, Sony Trinitrons, you get a horizontal grid pattern. and you can actually have uh, vertical lines across that they use the thin wires across to get better, better picture and that sort of stuff. And a lot of the emulation, you can get the best filter ever, it, it just can't recreate that. But then that means that you need to find space in your home for a CRT. You need to find one because a lot of CRTs in the early 2000s, they were just thrown out for landfall and destroyed. Finding them now is close to impossible because places like uh, if you're in the US, Goodwill and that, they're not allowed to sell CRTs anymore. It's actually illegal. So you mm. need to track one down somewhere and if you get it, it's probably going to have a little bit of burn-in, it's probably going to have bad capacitors, it's going to need a lot of work. So if you like doing that sort of stuff like I do, I love fixing things. It's great to grab one, it's great to fix one, and find a little bit of space for it somewhere, and nothing can compare to the quality that you get from a CRT. All of these other things we mentioned try to get as good to that as possible, but the real thing just can't be beat. But on the other hand, that is true. 20 years from now, 30 years from now, 50 years from now, there's not going to be many more CRTs that's going to exist and that's going to work. They're finite, they're going to disappear. So we really have to look at alternative methods of doing things, alternative technologies and that sort of stuff to try and get as close as possible. And FPGAs, of course, 20 or 30 years from now will get better and they'll add more screen filters and better support. Hopefully we'll see a N64 FPGA one day, or PlayStation 1 FPGA, they're going to be busy with one that fully runs perfectly. Mm. But and funny enough. Yeah, enough. Not too long ago, I saw an article, a museum displaying the artworks of Andy Warhol that he created on an Amiga 1000 back then. Well, they don't, they don't want to expose these original valuable Amigas anymore to an audience or can't do that. So they actually recreated Amigas and um, they had um, plexiglass lenses made to put on TFTs to recreate the curvature that the CRT had with this kind of lens back projection. Yeah, we'll try to get as close as possible, but I don't think that will be like a perfect recreation because if you look at how you project onto a CRT, it actually projects onto the curvature. So the pixels aren't perfectly square. And there's a whole bunch of other things that go into it, um, like mm -hmm. phosphor. Um, retention and phosphor bleed and that sort of stuff but we are even, trying to do that mm -hmm. even on a game boy you had games that would use the sluggishness of the game boy lcd display to create transparency by alternating background and foreground frame by frame so they would blend into each other you know especially on the shooter maps you used to do that so there's mm -hmm. all of these little intricacies and everything so 
for my advice to everyone listening that that they know electric gaming and that sort of stuff, don't get bogged down by these. Find out which one you can like going to, what the best way to collect is for you, and then go based according to that. So I think what we should delve into is where to start now if from our two perspective, where where to start from FPGAs and modern consoles and where to start from real hardware. Um, Would you mind going first on like a basic, I want to start collecting using FPGAs, how do I start? Well, if the analog consoles were currently available and it was one specific system that you're interested in, be it a Genesis, a Super Nintendo, or Super Famicom, or an NES, they would be a good bet, because you could buy your cartridge of eBay or dedicated marketplaces, but check prices before. On eBay, people try to sell them for way more than they're worth at worst condition that they should be. But if you have one, you clean it, you plug it in, you play it. That is the easiest way. Speaking of avail- availability, the Mister would probably be currently the best option. There are kits available with ready-built Misters that come with the expansion boards necessary and in a PCB case. But keep in mind, it's a do-it-yourself homebrew project, so don't expect everything to be perfect industry-grade quality. For example, the USB hub port that is available for the Mister. It works good enough when you only use a few selected low-speed USB components. I would rather recommend, if you have problem with that thing, get a proper USB board or USB hub to go with that if it causes you problems. Um, it is more expensive than an analog console and you would need to get either a retro or one of the other cartridge dumper projects out there to dump your own cartridges. What you can do on some systems, there are fan sites for the Commodore Amiga, for example, Dream17, who claim that they have a written permission by Team17 to host their old games for download, for people to play. That should be fine, so you can get Alien Breed there, which was a famous game on the Commodore Amiga. Everything else, well, it really needs a cartridge dumper. But luckily, the folks from RetroArch are already getting into that at creating an open platform cartridge reader. Getting ROMs. You can also get games and ROMs from compilations. For example, there's a recreation of the iconic Competition Pro Mark III joystick. This black joystick with the two red buttons and the red stick. A USB version that comes with games. There's also old classic CDs like one that I got off eBay was the Amiga Classics. That's where I got the floppy image of Hybris from a game that I had back then and liked to play a classic top scrolling shooter that was rather well done technology wise. Then nowadays you also get retro releases that are basically the old ROM bundled with an emulator. A lot of Neo Geo games you can get that way. The Neo Geo games are notoriously expensive. If you try to collect them, you better have a deep pocket. So it's a good alternative to get games like New Turf Masters, a great golf game, Blazing Star, which is a great side scroller, and some of the iconic fighting games from back then in the Neo Geo Classic collections. There's one complete collection. I got mine of Humble Bundle, the store itself, not a bundle. And a lot of these games run out of the box on the Mister when you copy them over and use the right XML file to map the files so that the Mister knows how to handle them. They also come with the system BIOS that works. So this is neat. Because it's not only the games, it's also the system BIOSes. For example, for Amiga, the uh, company Cloento owns the rights. So there's Amiga Forever, and you can get the necessary kick ROMs, as they're called, really cheap when you buy the Android version of their, I think it was called Amiga Forever Essentials. Like KickROM 1.3 and 3.1 is usually all that you need. So you can get it legally for cheap there. Same with the Commodore 64, they also offer a 
Commodore 64 Forever collection that comes with the basic ROMs. So it can be a bit of a search, getting the things that you want. So my recommendation is, do not aim for competition. Try to get the games that you actually want to play, because these games are worth playing. And having a huge collection in the end, that you all dumped, having a huge list of games that you never play, that's a bit of a shame, really. But up to you, what you want to do with your games. Yeah, and also um, there's modern recreations now as well these days. So there's oh, uh, modern games as well that you can actually get. They're still making new Correct. games for Mega Drive. Yeah, like Tanglewood and Xenocrisis. Both great games. You can simply buy them and play them. Or for the Commodore 64, the game Soul Force is actually a really nice side-scrolling shooter. So these platforms are still alive in a sense. Or NES, Lizard, the game. Also a new game for the NES. Yeah, so there's tons of avenues there to actually get games legally. You don't have to go the illegal route. And it's, it's a good alternative, especially for streaming, like I mentioned earlier. Uh, I just want to go down quickly the rabbit hole, which is real hardware. And unfortunately, this is, once again, a very broad topic. So my advice for you is listening. If you really want to get into, like, real hardware collecting, and you need to sit down and think about which systems you want to go after. Uh, that could be a system that you had in the past or something that you've got a very big curiosity for. And I would recommend uh, starting on Mark Facebook Marketplace, looking there especially, putting out wanted ads works extremely well on several places. If you're in America or the UK, eBay is absolutely phenomenal. You can pick up anything there, but be prepared to pay with the price. If you're good with electronics, buy a broken system and try to repair them but I won't recommend this unless you're already versed in electronics um, start with a system that's not new in box because as soon as you get like a new in box system you're looking at prices of 200 300 or more dollars per system so I would start with a nice new system whichever one you want to collect for and then uh, just go with that. But there's also one avenue, or well, two avenues that I'm going to suggest if you don't know what system to get for. And the first one is we spoke a bit about Game Boys at the moment. Game Boys are extremely well priced. Um, don't go for the original Game Boy DMG, the, the normal monochrome system, because the Game Boy Color actually plays all of the DMG's games. And it has a slightly better screen with slightly less blurring on it. And uh, you can go that sort of route. It's extremely well priced. In South Africa, you can pick those up for like 700 Rand. There's lots of them available. The games take up next to no room on your shelf. You can pick up hundreds of really, really good games. And then the last avenue that I would suggest going is for retro computer gaming. And this might come as a shock to you, but uh, on computers, if you want to play old DOS games, DOSBox isn't great. It's, it's actually fairly terrible, especially in sound reproduction, you know, the way the game sounded. Because back in the day, you had Sound Blaster was the dominant one that you used to go for, and it had a lot of noise and a lot of interference, and they didn't all sound the same but it had this very unique sound with it. And to get those sort of systems, you can get them for free. All it takes is going to a few companies or friends and saying, hey, I'm looking for your old computers. Do you have anything laying in the attic that you haven't been using? I don't care how old it is. And then grabbing that and playing with it. Things like upgrading it, getting used to how DOS works, all of that is dirt, dirt cheap. And it's a ton of fun to do that. But yeah. you do have the, the negative for that is the actual cost of uh, space. It takes up way more space to, to go to that route. The other thing with sort of games you mentioned before that you can actually purchase games from Steam and all of that, you can actually use that on the real consoles as well. You need something like an EverDrive. They're fairly inexpensive. It's basically what's known as a flash card, which just means it's a programmable cartridge. That you can go, you can put any game you want to on there, you can play it on the real system. But once again, please get the legal ones, get the bundles, get that sort of stuff, or homebrew, or modern games, you know, for it. 
don't go the route of just downloading a ROM pack because A, that's illegal, and B, there's nothing worse than losing excitement for a system because you've got everything available for it. And suddenly now you procrastinate about what should I play on it. Now having a limited selection or a selection of games that you worked to accomplish actually helps a great deal with, with that. It stops you from procrastinating and it feels it makes you feel grateful for when you actually play a game. That is true. So when you hunt down a cartridge on eBay, for example, and you score that auction, this is yours. Then you refurbish it, you clean it up, and if it works, this is your game, your physical copy that you can play. And Faz, maybe we should also quickly raise the topic of how do you organize your collection and how do you get an estimate of the price of a game to know what it's actually worth? Yeah, you know, we can quickly just give some examples of software things, but we are running a bit low on time, so. Ah, not only quickly, I personally use pricecharting.com to get an overview of past eBay auctions, and I use the Android app Retro Game Collector, where I record all my games that I bought with what they're worth, and it gives me estimates of what the games are usually worth, be it a single cartridge or complete in a box. So, yep, that just- is... One point. Nice is you can take that application with you when you actually go out to charity shops, second-hand shops, those sort of things, and buy some Precisely. games there and then reach out to the community. You know, I buy duplicates all the time because I can go to the community and I can go, hey, I've got these duplicates. Anyone wants to trade me? And then we sort of trade games amongst each other and build new friendships, A. But B, that's also a great way to get games that you don't normally find for sale often. Mm-hmm. So it's absolutely vital to have like an app like that when you go out. And speaking of community, yeah. let's uh, quickly talk about the communities that you can join to get more information. And that's a good end of uh, topic. Gladly. So what I would suggest uh, everyone do is there's a few people I really much, pretty much follow on YouTube that that's got communities already. It's fairly awesome. That's fairly good. The retro gaming community is also very much welcoming to furries. There's no real big problems with furries, even though retro gaming is a much younger community, I would say. So the first one I would suggest everyone check out for is a channel called Retro Man Cave. He does reviews, repairs of all the systems. He's got a podcast that he has there. But most importantly, it's got a very friendly and welcoming Discord that's got a lot of members on there. A lot of them like sharing information. They like helping people out. They feel normally, for the most point, chilled and mellow. Um, not every community you go to will be chilled and mellow. I think you, Kidra, mentioned something before we started about that. Yeah. The retro gaming community is a very broad field and because it's attached to memories of the childhood and how you played the games back then, there isn't really that one consensus. Like there are people who are pixel purists who want a pixel perfect image and then there are the ones who want to recreate more the look of a CRT. And since it's gaming, so you do not need necessarily to have the in-depth technological knowledge to get into it, but if you get uh, want to get involved, it's better to have it, to be able to talk along. So have a broad spectrum of people, great enthusiasm for the systems with great help and people who want to help out, but you have all kinds of characters there. So I would suggest pick the community that fits you the most. May it be a big community or a small community, check how it feels and in the end, play the games how you enjoy them. Yeah, that's the best way to sort of go into any community, I would say, is don't pay too much attention. You're there to have fun. Don't start arguments and try to be that person that uh, tries to tell everyone how they should enjoy their hobby or their entertainment. You know, that's just good general advice. The other community I want to mention, you heard me speak very briefly about computer collecting, and that is Vogons. It is a web forum. Um, it has hundreds of members on there. It's got tons of activity. You can post pictures of your computers. Just about every technical question you can think of. You've got a computer that you're trying to build and something doesn't work. You can find it on Vogons. 
it's a fantastic community to get into for that. I can only support you in assessment of the Retro Man Cave. I'm there too. And already could help a few very nice people there with getting their Mister started, for example. Otherwise, I mean, there's the official Mister community, of course. MrFPGA.org. Um, there is the classic gaming Discord. Also a very broad community with sub-channels for all sorts of systems. But that is about all that come to my mind now. So I guess that's a bit to pick and choose from. In terms of books, is there any good books that you can recommend as well? Because I know not, not everyone wants to join a community and they want to do self-research. So I think it's all great, right? Oh, uh, now we're going into the deep end. You know, I'm a fan of bitmap books. I like their books because they um, have really nice visuals and touch on individual games and the history of the games. Then there are various books on the actual history of video games. I think it was MIT that even had a so-called platform study series where I really like the book uh, Racing the Beam, which is about the Atari 2600. So there are various publishers out there who create books on retro systems and they're usually very high quality. Just be a bit careful on Amazon eBooks because there is a lot of cash grabs now, like really cheap produced books that are churned out in bigger quantities. So check these samples. And if it doesn't look good to you, the book, trust your senses, it's probably not good at all. But on the other end, um, I would say there is bitmap books, where you also get ebook versions of the books that you buy, usually. Uh, and I actually think that's a good place to end because we're now at one hour on the dot. Um, so we can quickly do like final thoughts, maybe. Yeah, so basically, uh, final thoughts from my side is we've, we've given you a ton of little tidbits and little bits of information. So don't feel too overwhelmed by all of this. We try to give like you like little insights into everything, good start off points, why we, as we do it, uh, why we find enjoyment out of the hobby, that sort of stuff. Uh, but if you want any more information about anything, you can reach out to me on Discord. I'm Fussman on Discord. Uh, Twitter as well. I'm FussmanZA on Twitter. So you can just drop me a DM there and I'll be happy to help out wherever I can. I mean, if you've got an old game system you want to fix up and install, just drop me a message. Yeah. And as Fastman already said, don't get discouraged by the tone of information. It's actually a good thing that it's such a broad topic because the more there is, the more a cozy place you can find for yourself in that community with your system, your way of gaming, and the new friendships that you can forge on the way. And uh, some of those friendships I've had for donkey's years, it's like the furry fandom. It really is its own hobby um, and in its own passion in itself. Thank you so much for joining. Cheers. Thank you.